thank you for um, connecting with our community and speaking about your practice that I've been with today or whatever else comes up with your practice as well. And um, we met in January to start the year in 2020, which feels like a lifetime ago. And we actually had the privilege of going and um, staying for a few days on your marae, which was deeply nourishing for me. I hadn't spent as much, I'm from Fielding, so like the middle of the North Island, so I hadn't spent as much time up north, up north. We usually stopped at Auckland whenever we would journey. So it was really beautiful to connect into that part of the country for me. So super grateful that um, your whanau and your hapu and everything allowed us to to stay there. It was really special. Awesome. Yeah, it was It was really special for me too to take you guys there and, and to um, go through that whole journey. Uh, the, the beautiful thing with wānanga is it's always that even when you're facilitating, as you know, you're still in the wānanga. And so... <laughs> Taking you guys there was all part of the Wananga for me too, and it was really beautiful to get to share that time and space and to have the whānau come and really feel like they wanted to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really hope to be able to take to make that happen more regularly and take people back there. They loved having you guys there. Um, so on my mum's side of Ngātikahuki Whangaroa, which is the hapu where that Whanatūpuna is that we went and stayed, which is in the Whangaroa Harbour there. Um, ki te tahu tōku kato on my father's side of Whakapapa to Ireland, England and Denmark. It's been an interesting journey for me. I was born and raised in Titarangi in Auckland. Um, it's a really beautiful place, um, immersed in nature and um, it had a big effect on me, I think. I spent most of my early life there and up north. I'm now moving back. I'm moving up to Whangarei at the moment with my partner. And that's really exciting because it feels like it's like a return home. It's like I can feel my super calling and they're just slowly, slowly reeling me in. <laughs> yeah, there's all this, these paradigms around why she didn't take these children home. And then I'm the children of the, these children. And so it's, it's had a, um, to build that journey home has been quite a, um, it's, t it's been a long time in the making. And I look back now, one of my mum's older sisters who had a different father, so she had been raised up north, she took me up home when I was 13 and took me and introduced me to everybody and got me to write their names down and just did this whole thing about trying to get me to feel that connection. And it was it was a really remarkable thing that she because gave me. Because I feel me. at least a lot of people that I connect with here that are maybe second generation in Australia, but are Māori and um, can feel disconnected sometimes. It's a real um, witnessing and... Yeah. offering to them to, to recognise that we all have a bit of that regardless of even how dark we are or, or how much to know we speak or that we all have bits that we feel that longing and loss of as well. Then I've got a lot of fun over in Australia too and I know for some of them, they, um, my, my cousin's children, they come back to Aotearoa and they really connect to the energy and the whakapapa. They go back to Australia and, and can't quite um, locate themselves in it it can be quite challenging you know the thing that gets me is that um it's all skin deep anyway because our perception of separateness and our perception of being different to one another is merely a perception thing and at the end of the day we're all the same we all come from the same place it's what's in your heart that matters what our ancestry gives us a hint of is that 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 connectedness, that sense of connectedness that we have? If you have a bit of fucker papa. If you do fucker papa to this whenua, you can feel it when you stand on this whenua, right? And and, and you can feel your tupuna calling you, and all of that. And if we tune in even deeper, on a deeper level, uh, we all have that to the whole of Papa Tuanuku. You know, we are all connected. We are all from the same place essentially, anyway. And our sense of separateness is is merely that. It's just a perception. That yeah, and I couldn't I, initially for me when the same thing was happening. I couldn't conceptualize how it could weave together for me, and as well having like a Maori side and a non Maori side. It was like they were always fairly separate. It was like, oh, we go here and we do that with that family. We go here and we do that, and then the the weaving of it together and acknowledging both, you know, both sides. Yeah. Um, when I went to Europe last year with Buruto, it was really interesting. My, I could really feel that other side of my whakapapa being activated and brought in. Because the thing is, this knowledge is indigenous, right? And all cultures were once indigenous. So there is indigenous knowledge. And so there's seeds of indigenous knowledge within us from all mm -hmm. of our ancestries. Mm -hmm. On a cellular level, we store in our bodies, um, and that could be our physical body, our emotional body, our psychological body, our spiritual body. We store every experience that has ever happened to us, 
everything we've ever witnessed, everything we've ever felt, everything we've ever thought is stored somewhere within us on a cellular level. And Romidong and Wirimiri can work to shift those energies and clear them out. And it's kind of like if our bodies were like a memory stick, which I think of it like it is because it does, it stores it all. Mm-hmm. And it's like a memory stick, you get to a certain point, that memory stick is full. It can't have anything new, there's nothing more. You need to clear that memory stick out. So I see Romidong and Wirimiri is like that. They serve to just clear they just come through like a wave and just clear that clear the body of all of that memory and so it can be like that on all levels it could be gentle it could be soft or it could be really deep and it depends on what it is that's been cleared and how far back it is it's and and, you know whether it's from your lifetime or your previous lifetime or further up the whakapapa or I was actually unwell myself and it was an it was an autoimmune disease and it was one that my mum had had and three of my cousins have got and you know it's it really predominant in our in my mum's line I had tried everything and I was saying what I need is traditional Māori healing that will help me that's what I need I don't know I don't even know where I got the idea from I don't know where I even heard of it from at the time I ended up I was so unwell that I was looking for a miracle I stumbled across a Romirui clinic and started going there and then next thing you know the interesting thing was um it sort of went sideways and I got offered surgery which until then no one was prepared to operate on me because I was that unwell and I took the surgery and realized afterwards that that was the miracle and the interesting thing was it felt like it was my tupuna it was my ancestors that stepped in and made that possible because it was so uncanny the way it all happened and then I forgot all about Māori healing and got on with my life and carried on. And, and then I ended up with this job and I turned out, um, my boss uh, said to me to come with her one day to a meeting. Well, it turned out it wasn't a meeting. It was a puri on the beach. And I was like, what? <laughs> and we're turning up there in our office clothes. <laughs> oh, we're not getting submerged though, right? And she's like, no, 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 we're not getting submerged. Well, next thing we're getting submerged. <laughs> the person I was working for, her cousin was Ruito. After that, they then set to work at getting me to go to Wānanga. They were like, now come to Wānanga. And I was like, oh, I don't have time for Wānanga. I tend to always be reasonably reluctant to move forward in life. <laughs> I'm my own worst. <laughs> way too busy. On, you know, I, and, and I just fought it the whole way. And as soon as I went, it was just, nothing was ever the same again. So I then went to the next five Wānangas in a row. I again, I, I, I have pulled back again and I sort of tried to, go, to just go and get on with life and I kept doing that. And then I would like bump into Ruto in the most unlikely of places or, you know, like Wananga would just present itself to me. It would just put itself right in front of me where I couldn't ignore it. And it, that just kept on happening until I, <laughs> and so I really can feel now in hindsight how my tupuna were again reeling me in slowly and you know, yeah. occasionally yeah. pushing me and kicking me. But I'm just actually allowing myself to be led. I'm not trying to figure it out for myself anymore. I just, I've given up trying to do that. That didn't work so well, I've realised. Actually, I'm better giving it over to the ancestors and the universe and my kaitiaki and just trusting. I so <laughs> understand that. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I was just talking to a client the other day who's really going through quite a bit during this time and um, she's really dying for a session as an example of a person. And she's been through, tried a lot of different practices to try and help her work through that stuff. And she just can't believe how the romiromi and the midi works to, to just how different she feels. How, as, a, as, a, as a human being, as her experience of life is just, we were laughing because she was saying that sometimes the, the sessions are quite painful. And I was saying to her, you know, it's not, I, the thing I need you to always remember is it's not me. Because sometimes she'll be crying and I, you know, and, and I, and she says, I know, and I can tell that it's not you. I can tell that something else is happening at that point and that you're not going to listen to me no matter what. <laughs> like I have to just go through that and get through to the other side of it. So different now after regular throwing a pebble in a pond, you throw one pebble in, you'll get some ripples out because the ripples out occur even after you hop off the table, right? But the more pebbles you throw in that pond, the more ripple out you're going to get until that pond looks completely different. You've completely changed the the structure of that water. And Mm. so the same. So if if we keep coming and getting on the table regularly, regularly enough for long enough, eventually we are different. We we become completely different. Potential to become our true selves and the true potential of who we actually are, which is such an exciting Mm. Mm. But that I've found is really unique and beautiful about um, Maori healing is how we do work in group and we bring 
um, anyone who wants to connect with it into uh, that group space. How do you find working, the difference between working on your own or working in a group? Um, it's quite remarkable. Um, but the interesting thing is when you're working by yourself also, like in private sessions, often uh, the, the room is so full anyway. <laughs> <laughs> love the support of working together with with other practitioners because you can just feel like you're not having to hold that space by yourself that that mm. that, that sense of community is mm. one of the beautiful aspects of this healing yeah mm. and it's almost quicker I find like oh. when I'm working on my own I find that it might take a while for that person to drop in but oh, not everyone you know but some sometimes but it seems like in a group it's like the portals are open and everyone's just like right let's go oh, right and I guess because you've got you're out you're outnumbering them too mm. right straight away you're the energy of people bringing energy and holding space is outnumbered the person receiving and so that's you're hardly working alone <laughs> and that's the funny thing because in this line of work it's always about us stepping out of the way so that all of the tupuna and the kaitiaki and everybody can step in and do what needs to happen and so we're really we're never really <laughs> getting to work alone <laughs> if we're in the zone and and stuff's happening which you'd hope it would be it's kind of like I've stepped out of the way to allow that to happen so I'm not I'm not detached but I'm not attached if that makes any sense and Taku Taku and Waiata and also just practice, just time. I found that when I first started, I might get, um, because we tend to be quite em em emphatic type of people that get involved in he the healing work, right? So when you hear somebody in pain or you see something, it's like, oh no. And um, so definitely that was a journey for me to get through. And you know, like I've had clients where it's their first time on the table and next thing you know, I'm like, oh, heck, okay. <laughs> And they're getting off the table going, what just happened? And you're like, oh, well, mm. it's it's an interesting one to start trying to explain to people who've got no previous experience or knowledge or understanding to draw on of what actually just took place and how gently you can start trying to offer the understanding of mm. what that is. Yeah. Uh, entity removal, which is such big, heavy, painful work. The number of times that someone would get on my table in a clinic in a community clinic that needed a, a, a entity removal and next thing you know I'm like in the middle of it and I'm like oh and so it was really learning on my feet with that one and um yeah and, and in the community environment it's good because my awareness was always around keeping everybody else in the room safe making sure everybody is safe in this space right I guess it's like what it must be like for a midwife watching a woman giving birth you sort of get used to yeah, that's how it is. It hurts, and the quick and and trying to encourage the person to let go and to remember it's not them and it's not theirs, and the sooner they are able to let it go, the sooner they're going to move through it and to just breathe it out. And um, yeah, it's sort of like that. Kind of feels like that sometimes. Like you are a midwife and you're kind of trying to help them birth through and let that energy shift through and release it. I can't think of a nicer way to put that. <laughs> a gentler term. It's like. Um, that because I have trouble with it as well that but I'll also say for me I'll, I'll it depends on the sense I have the person and where they're at in their journey but sometimes it'll be like you know anger can also form a cluster of um emotion that, that actual just it's the emotion it doesn't need to be an external essence or sadness or grief that's right it's made me um give quite a bit of thought and consideration to that whole aspect and what it is and what's actually going on and i it's like dark energy is attracted to our shadows and the more we try and suppress our shadow side the more the darkness is attracted to it because what is suppressed will be expressed and so um there's this funny thing where if we deny because everybody's got a shadow side right everybody's got but dualities are present in everything. There's two two sides. The more we press it down and suppress it and pretend it's not there, and also the more we actually, if we totally sink into our shadow side as well, if we do either of those options, not acknowledging, but we're kind of getting lost in our shadows. So if we get lost in our shadows or we try and suppress our shadows totally, either one of those is an attraction to dark energy, it seems. 
and that dark energy once it's attracted it can attach itself to you and then it can sort of feed off our shadows mm. and so and that could be anything from thought processes and it can happen as a child even um, when something happens and we have an emotional response to it so if we're in an, an emotionally compromised state negative energy is going to be attracted to us and attach itself to us because we're kind of opening the door to it mm. it's kind of like an invitation mm. and so when we are emotionally vulnerable it's about making sure we're keeping ourselves safe and we keep our environment safe yeah, I, because... the way I put it to him in the end was that it was like the energy was putting him in the boot of his own body and taking the driver's seat it got to the point where he was just about he was no longer himself like he didn't even look like himself anymore if he didn't take charge it was going to take charge and he you know and it was it was telling him to kill himself it was it was it was talking him into getting out of his body through him acknowledging that that energy actually wasn't his it had attached itself to his energy that it matched and that's the interesting thing i think that enabled him it's to create that point of difference to see that point of difference then it starts the disattachment starts at that point mm -hmm. yeah it's a different texture almost yeah but and good and bad is a human concept it's a human yeah. concept, whereas energy just is and it's it there's light energy and dark energy and it's the duality and everything it's always going to be there right the fact that it, 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 everything is energy is one of the things that helps me to stay neutral whenever I think anything's coming up because I'm like oh I speak energy it's like my language and this is just a part of the language one of the things I've noticed is that when we're really really in alignment some of that the blocks can also come up so when, when we've been staying like in a flow state for ages and everything's just been and then that that darkness can come up because it's no longer in a match that that pathway of okay well you can either fall into it or see it as separate and allow it to release as well do, do you see that yeah it's like when you're at that point of shift right and I think that's a lot of what's been going on for people like ourselves during this time the the whole all the energy of the entire universe at the moment is in a huge shift and it's the same sort of thing and it's like it can either continue the way that it was or there can be a change when we do this work I think we're drawn to do this work because the veil is already thinner for us and then because we do the work it kind of thins it out even more and um which is why I think protection is so important for us but whatever is going on out in the universe is happening in miniature within us because we are the universe in miniature right the whole cosmos the whole universe is within our bodies and so that shift that's going on in the universe is also going on inside of us and so it's created a lot of woof for a lot of healers or highly sensitive people in this time and it's been quite a journey to go through that and so I think it's beautiful because it's what you're saying it's exactly that it's that we're at a point in time where we need a shift and where vibrationally there is a shift happening um it's just how that shift looks it's not it remains to be seen but, but we only ever get the gifts of this life if we're prepared to take that first step off the cliff and as scary and overwhelming and uncertain as that can feel to trust the universe the whole thing is to um trust that if we fall backwards into life the universe will catch us and the only way you'll ever find out is by taking that step being of service and helping other people is so rewarding as a thing to do and whether you um end up making it the main thing that you do with your life or not it's still and and also as part of your own healing journey that's actually one of the most important things because I think as a practitioner the minute we stop working on ourselves and acknowledging our own journey the minute we stop being able to be of service and so and we all have that we all need to walk on that healing journey of our of, of our own I think people I feel like people will be more hungry for it almost uh, like close true. to this because it is yeah. such a gift and such a needed, yeah, like process. And it's almost as though like not, I mean, I've found that as well, like not having access to body work to, has not only giving, but also receiving has been challenging <laughs> when you're, well, I'm used to having so much. Um, so yeah, I feel like there'll be a real hunger for it in a healthy way, um, as well as the dark, the darkness that's come up or the, blocks that have come up in the time the one ira that's one of the gifts of this time though right and this is such an amazing opportunity to um for energy to reset and it was interesting because you know i don't go in with the gregorian calendar or or you know anything like that but but the fact that easter fell in the middle of this period 
for the world and the whole you know the the whole world has pretty much been affected by this there's not many things in our history that that actually make could make the whole world stop the thing about those those um christmas and easter and all of that what's interesting is that you know if you track them back far enough they're actually just celestial occurrences that are being marked and called something else but they because they are celestial they are um, having a profound effect on us because we are also celestial and you know so then in the middle of that we had easter which is a death and a rebirth and you know i think that's really what it is for all of us individually collectively as a as a species uh, on every level (laughs) um is there anything on your heart that you would want to speak into this space that we haven't touched upon people not buying into the illusion of this apparent reality and actually remembering their true nature and their true selves and honestly really our potential as individuals and and collectively is just so vast it's so all-encompassing that really I don't think we even touched the iceberg of it yet for sure so um on an individual level I practice under kahukura traditional Māori healing collectively I'm working under a new umbrella te kohanga o marama and um, we're going to put together some beautiful work as a collective um, offering to people. Um, we're going to have some really um, rich, deep online wānangas. We're going to look at doing online wānanga anyway, but now obviously it's going to be the obvious place to begin at this point. We really want to work with women and with youth and with children. I'm really... Um, driven to want to help our tamariki because they are the seed of the future and um, yeah I think that if we can help them remember the heart strong warriors that they are then we put them in a stronger place to step forward into their world into this world yeah, I'll share, I'll share that with um, my community and my page when that comes through as well. So definitely send, flick it through to me and I'll, I'll pop, pop it up for everyone to access. Thank you. I'm so grateful for you for taking the time and for uh, being a teacher for me in January and um, what you're bringing forth in the future as well. So just want to acknowledge awesome. that. Thank you. It's a real honour and a pleasure. And um, that was a really hearty one, I that the mm. one you just so well to get through that you're never the same again right <laughs> <laughs> no no they're amazing I um yeah I and it's such a blessing as well being in Australia and getting to go home and like connect for that amount of time um, it would be beautiful to bring people home and wanting with them and take them <laughs> to the whenua and take them you know tingles <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, I'm, I'm pinpointing that in the universe. Kuriopi, <laughs> 